All right, so we're talking about how the Great Awakening helped relieve the shortage of clergy in the 13 colonies. And the first way was just by uh, lowering the standard for uh, admission to the profession. Uh, a lot of these revivalist pietists are okay with uh, relatively uh, uh, less educated people, people lacking a formal education, um, uh, preaching. But a lot of the folks in the colonies, including many Great Awakening revivalists, believe religious education is important. They still want qualified clergy. And so, in fact, most of... Um, okay, so a bunch of colleges get founded during the Great Awakening expressly to train clergy. Now, as I mentioned before, before the Great Awakening, there was just Harvard College for training clergy. After the Great Awakening, uh, or during the Great Awakening, pretty much every other Ivy League college that you've ever heard of, uh, Princeton, Yale, Columbia, Dartmouth, are founded to uh, train new clergy. So uh, now, you know, training is available in the 13 colonies. The Great Awakening ends up weakening established churches. Now, established church is a... Um, Established church is a vocabulary term in this class. It has a specific meaning in uh, American history. An established church is a government-sponsored church, um, you know, where you know governments are collecting taxes to finance churches. It's the recommended religion that people are are supposed to go to, um, and. Most colonies had an established church. Uh, Rhode Island and Pennsylvania were the exceptions. Um, in most of the colonies, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, was the established church, uh, just as the Anglican Church was the established church back in Britain. The uh, exception was in New England, the Puritans, uh, uh, the Congregationalist Church, the Puritan Church was the established church. Anyhow, this idea that um, there should be an alliance between church and state. By the way, that idea was as old as civilization, um, but um, it had, you know, it was Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, who first suggested that maybe that wasn't required all the time. And the Great Awakening, because it's giving people more religious choices, it's making more people question the concept of an established church, because like everybody has to pay taxes to support the established church. But now that the Great Awakening is making more choices available to that to people, more people are choosing to go to churches other than the established church and are wondering, why do I have to pay taxes to support this church that I don't go to? And then I go to the church I do choose, and I've got to donate out of pocket to, um, to support the church. Doesn't seem fair. So in the long run, the Great Awakening is going to weaken support for established churches. Great Awakening also has an impact in the South. Um, before the Great Awakening, most slave owners didn't work very hard to convert slaves to Christianity. But during the Great Awakening, they conclude that this is in fact their religious duty, so owners, uh, so-called masters, uh, start evangelizing their slaves. They start uh, converting their slaves to Christianity, encouraging and ultimately requiring slaves to go to church with them. Church, of course, uh, the slaves sat in a, in a separate section, um, usually in the back or in a, in a balcony uh, purpose built for that. But the, you know, it raises a fair question like, why does it take the Great Awakening um, to do this? Um, why, you know, why weren't Southern slaveholders doing this before? And the answer goes back to the original rationale for slavery, right? Originally, um, you know, the medieval Christian church, uh, the Catholic church said, you know, Christians don't enslave Christians. And, you know, it, initially it was okay to enslave Native Americans or to enslave Africans because they weren't Christian. And so there was some reluctance by Southern slave owners to convert their slaves to Christianity because if they became Christian that that could undermine the logic of their enslavement. But now, um, you know, racism had been growing over time anyway because, um, you know, slavery uh, had come to be defined as a racial category. Africans 
you know, slavery is becoming intergenerational in the New World, so um, all black people are assumed to be slaves. And the message of the Great Awakening is um, you should, um, you know, slave owners should convert their slaves to Christianity um, so they don't go to hell, but you can still keep them in slavery, right? So now um, the religious justification for slavery is gone, and now the justification for slavery is entirely racial because this invented concept of white supremacy um, is, is now so strong that it justifies slavery even if the slaves become Christian. Now, of course, the real agenda behind slavery is always making money, right? I mean, you know, slavery is, um, is a way to make people work without having to pay them. And uh, so, you know, greed uh, is always the, the, the real goal, but uh, initially religion was a justification and now racism. So maybe now that masters are converting their slaves to Christianity, maybe they're going to treat their slaves better? No. Sadly, there is no evidence that treatment of slaves changed. The only uh, material change um, we can see in the historical evidence is that slaves now were required to go to church. Um, it, uh, there's, there's no evidence that um, slavery became any less miserable. All the uh, different forms of mistreatment we talked about before continue uh, unabated after the Great Awakening. Now, on to long-term effects of the Great Awakening. There's our man George Whitfield again. The Great Awakening finally breaks the Puritan monopoly in New England. Uh, before the Great Awakening, New England was pretty overwhelmingly Puritan. There weren't a lot of other religious choices, but the Great Awakening slowly begins to change that. And there's competition now in New England. So we, you know, there was some religious diversity in the 13 colonies before, uh, a lot of religious diversity in the middle colonies, some in the South. Now there's even some in New England. So religious diversity is a fact of life now in all 13 colonies. A lot of scholars argue that the Great Awakening uh, ends up being a rehearsal for the American Revolution, right? The Great Awakening's in the 1730s and 40s. Revolution's not going to uh, start gearing up until the 1760s and 70s, but um, scholars argue that um, this situation where um, the younger generation is rebelling against the um, religion of their parents and getting away with it prepares the ground um, in the coming years for people to uh, rebel politically against Britain, and we see they end up getting away with that too. So, um, sort of giving people practice at rebellion. Also, the Great Awakening changes the way people speak in public. Uh, before the Great Awakening, when people were giving speeches or sermons, they used uh, pretty sophisticated language that was hard for regular people to understand. This, by the way, is part of the reason sometimes people didn't want to go to church because they literally did not understand uh, sometimes what the priest and minister was talking about because the language was so uh, sophisticated. Great Awakening pioneers the new plain style of rhetoric. One of the reasons that preachers like Edwards and uh, Whitfield are so effective is because they speak in you know simple language that everybody can understand, and you know when people understand what you're talking about, that's more interesting, and you're you're more likely to uh, respond and you know follow um, speakers. The, there are uh, some downsides. Anti-Catholic paranoia was already high in the English Empire, but. Um, the Great Awakening stokes it further. The revivalists are, are pretty hardcore anti-Catholic. They're so hardcore anti-Catholic that um, the anti-Catholic paranoia, the seeing popish plots everywhere, begins to um, distort their view of the Anglican Church, right? This is confusing because Anglicans are Protestants, but the fact that Anglicans were continuing some Catholic traditions made some Great Awakening revivalists argue that the Anglican Church was also uh, part of a, an evil popish plot. 
the most surprising long-term effect of the Great Awakening is that it doesn't last. Um, you know, the um, it would be easy to assume that the Great Awakening is like this shot in the arm, and you know, colonial religion you know shakes off its torpor and and um, becomes amazing, um, and America becomes more religious after the Great Awakening. But that's not what happens. Um, it's really an ephemeral movement. The 1730s and 40s see a temporary upsurge in religious belief, and after that initial enthusiasm wears off, there's a huge drop in church attendance. It doesn't just go back to the way it was before. It gets worse. You have fewer people going to church, fewer people caring about religion, even though there's now more choices and more churches. The late 1700s, ladies and gentlemen, end up being the least religious time in the history of the United States. So... Um, in you know the 13 colonies and the early United States, the era of the founding fathers, our country is born during the least religious period in American history.